Hi everyone, I'm Miss Katie from Rockland Public Library and happy Women's History Month. I thought we would do some celebrating by reading a picture book biography. This is The Only Woman in the Photo of Frances Perkins and Her New Deal for America, written by Kathleen Krull, illustrated by Alexandra Bai. Let's see what happens in The Only Woman in the Photo. Little Frances Perkins was shy. She couldn't speak up even when asking for a book at the library or a spool of thread at the store in her cozy New England town. She was m most comfortable with her grandmother who encouraged her to always keep trying. Her grandmother would say, take the high ground if someone insults you and when someone opens a door to you, go forward. So shy Frances tried her hardest in everything that she did. Frances was quiet, but she was a watcher and a listener. She was sad to see how young Irish immigrants were being screamed at and chased out by people who hated newcomers. She felt sorry that her best friend's families were not as well off as hers. Her parents said that if you were poor, it was your own fault. But Frances didn't believe that. She couldn't stand the thought of children going hungry or being in pain. She couldn't see how that could be their fault. She knew first aid and the other kids turned to her when they got hurt. She followed her grandmother's advice and always tried to help. Frances was a thinker at a time when higher education for women was new. People feared that women's delicate bodies would suffer if their brains got too big. But her father saw how smart Frances was. He taught her to read at an early age and encouraged her to go on learning. In high school, she mastered tough classes, including Latin and Greek. She blossomed from a whisperer to a star debater. The point was always to challenge herself. She always tried to be better than she was before. Going to college meant the world to Frances and a history course there shaped her future. The professor required students to observe the depressing conditions in the nearby paper and textile mills. Frances was horrified, especially from seeing the small children working so hard among the adults. I mean, everyone is working in conditions that aren't very good. It's not very healthy for them at all. And there are young children working very hard. The experience opened her eyes to other injustices in America, like those she'd glimpsed as a child. But there were the days when nobody expected the government to do anything, she said. Frances, Frances ached to help and to do that she realized she had to make her voice heard, even when speaking made her uncomfortable. In speaking up, Frances was learning to lead. Against her parents' wishes, they preferred her to start husband hunting. She moved to New York City and began working. A new way to help fighting justice, it was called social work and it was flourishing there. The more she saw, the more she wanted to help. She said, I had to do something about the unnecessary hazards of life, unnecessary poverty. It was sort of up to me. She started off delivering milk and food to starving children, getting landlords to give a break to those unable to pay their rent and asking for donations. In dangerous neighborhoods, she defended herself using the tip of an umbrella. Look at her. She's going out making sure that people have enough to eat. For these social justice issues to get proper attention, Frances believed women had to get more power. So she had, so she went even further. She was a fierce fighter of women's right to vote. She spoke out about suffrage in the street corners bringing her own grocery crate to stand on. Here she is. She honed her speaking skills and projected her voice. That means speaking really loud so people can hear all the way in the back 
and she used humor to deflect hecklers. Here she is practicing in her win by her window. After getting more education in social work and publishing her own articles on the subject, Frances kept working to protect others by taking a job gathering information on unsafe workplaces. She visited more than a hundred bakeries taking notes. Bread, dough, and pies were baked in airless rooms with dirty floors. So there aren't even any windows or anything, so it's hard for them to breathe. It's so hot in there. Rats nibbled on bags of flour and cats had kittens right on the counters where the food was being made. Dirty water instead of chocolate dripped into pastries. Frances saw sick workers bent over the dough and coughing. Children huddled there with their parents because they had nowhere else to go. She wrote it all down in her report and when she presented it to the New York Board of Health, bakeries were forced to improve their conditions and treat their employees better. But Frances didn't stop there. Next on her list was fire safety. So what do we do right now for fire safety? We have fire alarms to make sure that we know when there's a fire in the building. We have fire extinguishers. We also make sure there's multiple exits in a building. So if one of them is blocked by a fire, we can get out the other side. That kind of stuff didn't exist when Frances was younger. Next on her list was fire safety. She inspected 26 laundries, finding danger everywhere, and the problem was urgent. It became even more urgent after one horrible day in 1911. 30-year-old Frances was having tea with her friend when, a group, when the group heard a clanging of fire truck bells and an unearthly shrieking. She lifted up her long skirts and ran toward the scene of the fire. The triangle shirt waist factory was burning and the management worried about theft had locked their doors so that nobody could get out. The factory employed Italian and Jewish immigrants, mostly women and girls in their teens and early twenties. They were all trapped inside. Frances was sick to her stomach. And then she was outraged. To her, this was murder, a tragedy that could have been prevented. If no one else would become the voice of these women, Frances would try. Witnesses to the, tri the uh, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire returned Frances Perkins into an activist, so intent on helping others that she was ready to enter the all-male world of politics. Former President Theodore Roosevelt was heading up a, commu a committee uh, on New York City workplace safety. He'd heard good things about Francis as an expert investigator, so he recommended her to run the committee. Oh, she gets to run it. She began taking the others on tours of the work sites to view firsthand how dangerous and greedy the managers were. She studied the men who worked with her, looking for ways to overcome prejudice. Some men would never treat her as an equal, but if she reminded them of their, her, their mothers, in her staid three-cornered hat, she seemed to get more success. Her intense study of how men acted was worth it. The committee agreed with her, the fire precautions the moderate fire precautions we have today, like glass cases with fire extinguishers, fire exits, fire drills, and water sprinklers began to be required. So she put that all into action. The city passed the most comprehensive workplace safety law in the nation. It wasn't long before Al Smith, the governor of New York State, rewarded Frances hard work with her first big break in the government. He appointed her to the commission that regulated workplaces across the whole state. She was tongue-tied for a moment, but she decided to accept. The job was not just a grand opportunity to make her voice heard on issues that mattered to her, but it was so significant that it made her the highest paid woman to hold public office in the United States at the time. So it was a big step for women.
and something like that is a good thing to give better chances to other women. If people see that, yes, women can do this, heck yeah, women can, then they're more likely to be hired for other jobs. In her new role, Frances kept arguing for change, helping to pass dozens of laws that made New York safer for workers in copper mines, construction sites, and factories all across the state. In 1929, New York's new governor, Franklin D. Roosevelt, appointed Francis the state's industrial commissioner, overseeing more than 1,700 employees in seven cities. Wow. And soon it turned out FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, her boss, would need Francis even more. When the stock market crashed on Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929, it propelled the nation into the Great Depression. The country suffered as it never had before. About a third of working Americans lost their jobs. Then many lost their homes. Francis visit, visited the encampments where families were living in cardboard boxes and in tents. You see her visiting here, bringing supplies. President Herbert Hoover kept making reassuring statements predicting that the recovery was just around the corner, and Frances was furious. She knew it was not, and she had to speak up or else people would start blaming themselves for not being able to work. In 1930, she called a press conference to announce that Hoover, the president, was wrong and that she had the facts and the numbers to prove it. Yes, Frances Perkins, had just challenged the President of the United States. Telegrams and phone calls poured in to criticize her, but she said, I felt the satisfaction of someone who told the truth. In the 1932 election, Hoover was defeated in a landslide by none other but FDR, Francis's boss and he wanted Francis as the security, the Secretary of Labor in his cabinet of advisors. That, so that means he, she's gonna work with his close group. He was proposing a new deal, a fresh start for America in need, and she was a crucial part of that plan. A 52-year-old Francis hesitated. The challenge seemed extreme. And as the first woman ever to join the presidential cabinet, she would face a storm of criticism. But her grandmother's advice sailed into her mind and she knew what she had to do. She said, the door might not be open to women again for a long, long time. And I had a kind of duty to walk in, sit down in that chair I was offered. Challenging herself and using her voice, she realized would allow her to protect people across the nation and inspire other women at the same time. So Frances decided to accept the job if FDR, the president, allowed her to do it her way. She had been thinking up ideas for years. Now she wrote them all, all she wrote all her requests on slips of paper here they are, on slips of paper, to-do lists for helping the most vulnerable. So she wants to help those that need help the most. At their meeting, she held them up and watched the president's eyes to make sure he understood what she was planning. The scope of her list was breathtaking. It was nothing less than a restructuring of American society. Their talk lasted one hour until he finally said, I'll back you meaning he's ready to support her. Let's see what some of the things say. Some of her suggestions are abolish child labor, so, so getting rid of child labor, and social security, and workers receiving disability insurance, so if they get hurt, they have protections. Newspapers had headlines like, Boston girl, first woman cabinet member, working hard. Sure enough, Francis was now one of the 10 most powerful people in the government. Her Department of Labor was in charge of all matters concerning American workers. On her first day on the job, she took control of her desk, 
only to find the drawers crawling with the largest cockroaches she'd ever seen. It seemed a sign of how corrupt and how little work the last people with her job had done. She rolled up her sleeves, scrubbed out the desk, and plunged into work, basically working around the clock. At her first cabinet meeting, nervous about how best to make herself heard, Frances decided on a quiet approach. She said, I wanted to give the impression of being a quiet, ordinary woman who didn't buzz buzz all the time. As she had on her first, very first committee, she knew she would have to make the other men take her seriously. Finally, FDR turned to her with a smile. Miss Perkins, have you anything to say, anything to contribute? She spoke briefly about her recommendations for reducing unemployment and after the men, oh, and after that, men treated her as an equal, sort of. Some men in the department did threaten to quit if she continued to work with them. Others acted like schoolboys and passed silly notes about her during the meetings. One day, she testified before Congress and a congressman remarked, She's an awfully smart woman, but I'd hate to marry her. That's not very nice. While Francis heard the insult, she laughed about it and retorted, well, I didn't ask him. She had a job to do. The first hundred days were crucial. Francis had two phones on her desk and would sometimes answer them both at the same time. Mostly though, she was out of her office initiating a blizzard of big moves, an alphabet, of, alphabet soup of agencies. The Citizen Conser Conservation Corps, for example, put more than 2 million young people to work taking care of natural resources, stocking rivers with fish, planting trees, digging canals for flood control. With this, and her many other undertakings, it was thrilling for her to see how directly she was helping people. So she's putting some people back to work by finding new jobs. Things like restocking the fish into the water and planting trees. This gives all these people things to do and money that they can earn and bring home to their families. Wherever she was, a steel factory on the docks of the shipyard working in California, testifying to Congress, she was a voice for calm. Her goal was to establish a sense of security during this nerve wracking crisis. She accepted every invitation to speak, feeling responsible for explaining the new deal to the public. She met with FDR every 10 days or so. Remember that's the president. He liked to hear her advice with the, in the form of a story who specifically was going to be helped what exactly would be the results of the actions she recommended? With a story he could then relay to others, he would also support her latest ideas. Changing what change was really happening. Magazine headlines hailed Fair, Fearless Frances. One called her the woman nobody knows, giving her full credit for the New Deal. In the official pictures, she was usually the only woman in the photo. Here, these are her uh, recreations of real photos that were taken. And it's all of these important people, and she's the one woman there in those photos. Her most far-reaching dream became a reality in 1935 when FDR signed the Life-Changing Social Security Act into law. It established insurance for old age and for people who lost their jobs. It ensured compensation for those injured on the job. It guaranteed to the needy and disabled and even children under 18 in single parent families. It was, she said, a security which aims to protect our people against the major hazards of life. It was basically an enti her entire to-do list. She saw it as a turning point in her national life, a turn from careless neglect to human value, toward, uh, for human value, toward people working together for the common good. Hurling, hurtling one obstacle after the other, boldly speaking up, 
She transformed the government into a force that protected people. On a gigantic scale, she had reached her childhood goal of helping others. I had accomplished what I had come to do. She declared, hoping to return to a quieter life, but FDR valued her too much to accept her resignation. That means she was, when she finished her big goals, she said she was ready to leave her job, but he wanted her to stay. She was at his side for the first, uh, from his first day at the presidency to his last in 1945. In one of their final meetings, he was crying as she grasped his hand. Francis, you have done awfully well. I know what you have gone through. I know you, what you have accomplished. Thank you. After his death, she was finally allowed to resign. She kept working for her causes and lectured at universities, but out of the public eye. I haven't a flair for publicity, Frances said. She absolutely refused to write a book about herself. Once she said that seeing her picture in the newspaper nearly killed me. She actually stomped on a camera oh, of one photographer who took her picture despite her pleas to not do it. Oh yeah, so she asked him not to take her picture and he did it anyway. So when Frances died after suffering a stroke in 1965 at age 85, not many people remembered who she was and what she had accomplished. Social security, fire safety, workplace regulations, and many other laws that keep us safe are things we all take for granted. That means they're things that we don't really notice because they've always been there. But we should never forget the person who made all those things happen. A shy little girl who cared about others and grew up to protect them. The end. Great listening, everyone. You did such a good job. I know that was a longer book than we usually read. And I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about Frances Perkins. And today, see if you can find anything more about her or maybe learn about some other wonderful American woman. I hope you have a great day and I can't wait to read you all soon. Bye-bye.